Hey everyone, my name's Ty, I work at Uber. Uh, let's get started. Uh, when Uber was a small company, there was just a small group of engineers that worked on the mobile team and they could easily communicate and share knowledge. And that team could, uh, they built a single app in one repo uh, using old standard tools like Ant and Eclipse. And that app was really small, uh, it had a singular focus and it was a really solid MVP, you know, a first launch for the company. And that team grew very quickly with the business, going from one Android team to multiple teams, including a platform team with multiple uh, vertical program teams built on top of that. And the team thought it was important to address that scale that they were experiencing. So they standardized around uh, a pretty standard MVC architecture, uh, and they used modern tooling for the time. Uh, these components were very well defined and composed, and they allowed the engineers to work pretty well against the solid principles. And over time, that one app became multiple apps across different repos. And so common code was extracted uh, to create a library that both of the apps could depend on. And then that common code was modularized into multiple core libraries uh, that were versioned and then consumed as Maven dependencies. And with the new contributors coming on board and a good foundation, uh, they could scale and launch new product offerings in cities across the world. And that organic growth became massive with literally hundreds of mobile engineers contributing to a small number of applications. And so a lot of new pain points emerged regularly. Uh, tribal knowledge fell apart, uh, communication broke down, and the organization really slowed. Many more controllers were added to the architecture, and this caused bottlenecks to emerge, where some areas became bloated with scoped objects on the graph. Uh, these would be coupled to more downstream dependencies, creating a number of unmaintainable superclasses. And that iteration process slowed down to a crawl requiring updates of downstream dependencies, multiple sequential CI jobs, and then updates to multiple top-level apps. Developer productivity took a large hit, and architectural silos emerged. And the product choices continued to follow this organic growth model, essentially creating a kitchen sink of products to the end user with, a, with only a little bit of focus on usability. And the number of products down in the uh, bottom drawer became a joke to many. So at this point in 2016, we knew that growth couldn't be allowed to happen unchecked. Scale had to be planned for. And at this crossroads, Uber rewrote and redesigned the writer app uh, in a way that it would scale it for years to come. Now, this talk today is going to kind of cover some of the motivations behind this, as well as the tools and processes and opinions we had in trying to cover this opinionated scaling. Uh, to help you to prepare for scaling your own app if you ever need to without over-engineering your app. So today I want to talk about a few major areas of scale for us that we've made some headway against. First, we'll cover our project structure and the needs around that. Uh, then we'll talk about RIBS, which is our architecture solution and the backbone of our more recent and modern applications. And finally, I'll discuss some of the libraries and tools that we use to facilitate faster mobile development among all the teams at Uber. And this is in no way an exhaustive list of all the things we're doing. If I was going to provide that, we'd be here all day. This is going to be more of a crash course of a lot of the tools that uh, I think are pretty cool, and a lot of them have been open sourced. And uh, I'm not going to be recommending you should adopt all of these, but for specific needs, these may, you may find these uh, very useful. So, you may have noticed in my first slides that we more or less started in a mono repo and then split that out into multiple repos. Now, like many other companies at the scale that we've been operating at, uh, we ran into a lot of pain points that forced us to eventually consider the trade-offs of moving back to one mono repo for all of our application and libraries. Many of the developer productivity issues that I mentioned in the beginning of this talk could be pointed uh, directly at having to work across many, many repos. The three major pain points that we were feeling were issues with transitive dependencies, uh, updates being required in multiple repos, and then the duplication of effort across those. And this there was an emergence of multiple types of architecture and conflicts among different projects, and teams worked in more isolation. And long, times, long build times as the build system was really inefficient at parsing and building sub-modularized code bases. To demonstrate a problem of this multi-repo world, 
Let's assume that we have an app with a chain of transitive dependencies. And if an API breaking change is done at the bottom of the chain, uh, we would have uh, an engineer that uh, reviews a commit. It lands on master, a CI job potentially deploys that to a Maven repository. That engineer or team would then need to update the next one in the chain uh, to point to a new version, maybe update any APIs that shifted, uh, commit that, land that. That would go to, to a Maven dependency. Then they would need to move to the third, and then finally, maybe to the top level. You could clearly see that this is an inefficient scenario. More common, though, um, when that sort of situation happens is that it's not a, a clean implementation. Here you see a build script from, uh, from the apps and a library. And in this scenario, if you start to look carefully at the version numbers, you're going to see that uh, in this feature that we have defined in the bottom half of the slide, uh, we have some versions that potentially conflict with the version numbers defined in the top. Now, Gradle will resolve that version conflict by using the latest API by default if you don't set another resolution strategy. But this could be really problematic and cause runtime issues when perhaps uh, one of this feature library was requiring a certain version of the storage library and the app forced that to a newer version. Now, these pain points drove the decision to move from a series of multiple repos to one large mono repo per platform, Android and iOS. And this new project layout gives us the ability to update across multiple modules at once, uh, and it did really increase developer productivity. For example, here would be a similar build script um, example to what I showed earlier, but in a mono repo world. Instead of calling out these versions specifically, we can use Gradle's implementation or API project compilation. Now, in this scenario, we guarantee that we're using the same version both in the feature library and in the application. And if a developer needs to update something downstream, they can do that across the board in one commit. Now, in addition to the project structure, which I called out, uh, to maximize the gains for our developers, our developer experience team invested heavily in converting from Gradle to Buck as our primary build system. Now, while Gradle has made tremendous gains in performance with modularized code bases, at our scale of over 1,000 modules in our mono repo, Buck does give us better performance and fine-tuning possibilities. If you're not familiar with Buck, uh, it was built by Facebook, and it follows a similar architecture to, to Bazel, Google's mono repo build tool. Its build architecture is uh, based on cacheable outputs. Uh, Buck encourages many small modules, and it's highly parallelizable. Uh, it will really use all the cores on your CPU. I find that I have a hard time even streaming music when I'm kicking off a build. Because it's so parallelizable, it can cache these outputs of the small modules, and that makes it really fast. And if you use any of the advanced features, like network caching, it's even faster because if one of your teammates builds a module that you haven't changed, you can fetch that from the network and use the compiled files instead of having to, to run that yourself. Buck also has pretty good IntelliJ integration, um, which helps our developers keep a productive workflow including concepts like building, deploying, running tests, uh, using, and especially using unloaded modules uh, by generating the IML files for each module independently, which allows IntelliJ to work with very large repositories and index those in a way that's more performant than if you try to load the entire mono repo into the IDE at once. Now, Buck is more focused than Gradle, making it possible to attain greater speeds under certain scenarios. But it makes it less flexible overall. And it's also notoriously more obnoxious to configure the build scripts. And you have to have each one uh, build script per module. Now, because of this, I like to say Buck is like rocket skates. You'll go really fast, but you really don't want to change direction, and you especially don't want to fall down. So to address this hard-to-configure scripts and the lack of features that Gradle provides, like dependency management, which we would all argue is definitely needed. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about one of our open source projects called OKBuck, which is a Gradle plugin. So you add OKBuck OK to your Gradle project uh, using the standard pattern of, of plugins. And then you can execute a Gradle task that'll generate a Buck wrapper object. Now this Buck wrapper will, well, this, the, the task will configure your project and create that, um, the Buck configs per module, so you don't have to configure those yourself, which is super nice. 
Um, and then it creates this wrapper object that you can use, similar to how to use the Gradle wrapper. And it has multiple advantages. Uh, when you run that, it will download and install and update to the latest versions of Buck automatically. And it has minimal overhead in deciding when to run OK Buck as a Gradle task to regen these Buck scripts um, by understanding when like Gradle files are changed for dependencies and things like that, which uh, when you have a very large project like this, when you go to run Gradle and kick off the OK Buck task, it can take a really long time. So it's ideal that you uh, would want to minimize the amount that that runs. It also handles pretty gracefully the cases when OK Buck fails and it, uh, you know, maybe when the daemon stops um, and can restart that when needed. And so what this gives us is it gives us the speed of Buck, which clearly we need to empower all, our, all of our developers, with the simplicity and the features that Gradle provides, like dependency management. Another awesome feature when using the Buck build system is uh, a tool called ExoPackage. And this is only used for development builds. ExoPackage constructs a shell application where each module's dex file uh, can be hot swapped out at runtime. Now, this allows much smaller changes to be deployed to the device, uh, very similar to Instant Run, uh, but it usually works pretty well. Here on the first run, uh, the APK builder will uh, create an, the shell APK and it'll dex create all the DEX files, and all of that will be installed to the device at once. So you're going to get a pretty standard install time. But on subsequent compilations, it's only going to load the changed DEX files across ADB. And the uh, shell APK will hot swap those out. And what that really improves for you is the install time. On a really big app, you uh, might even see 30 to 40 seconds being taken to run ADB install. And uh, using something like this, you're going to see those installs happening usually in a second or two uh, on the subsequent compilations where the, the exo package has been delivered to the device. The last uh, helpful build tool that I want to cover solves a problem that I'm sure most of you have experienced at one point in your career. Um, and as you get a larger code base, in my mind, this happens a lot more frequently. And that's uh, master breaking, even after the CI jobs have run and verified your tests. Now, this is most likely going to happen because you have uh, you know, maybe two, two developers that have committed, and the CI jobs both verified those independently, and they both went to merge those. Um, and those are going to have merge conflicts or something. And together, that's going to cause master to break. And when we were scaling up to hundreds of engineers, we were seeing master be broken once or twice or three times a day. And that's uh, incredibly hurtful to productivity around the company. People would do a git pull and a rebase. Things would be breaking. They didn't know if it was their feature that they were working on or if master had been broken. Um, teams were rushing to get features in, and that's a problem. Um, so we introduced this tool called SubmitQ. And now, uh, SubmitQ is a concept that's used in a lot of open source libraries and at different companies. But it's essentially a, um, a similar CI job that runs a set of automated tests and validates that things are going to merge successfully uh, prior to them getting merged into the code base automatically. Um, I would recommend, if you guys are interested in something like this, looking into the Kubernetes open source community. They have one of these that runs publicly, and it's a pretty good model to, to look at. Now, with our project structure defined, compiling and sailing smoothly, uh, it's time to move into how we actually build the applications and some of the runtime and compile time libraries that we talk about. Now, in early 2016, uh, we, we did this rewrite. And with that, a group of engineers was charged with uh, researching and figuring out an architecture that would scale out for uh, the future of the Uber apps for at least a few years. And uh, so they researched many existing solutions and ended up proposing um, our own that uh, would be codenamed Presidio, uh, which would become the foundation of our modern apps that we have today. And so there were a number of goals that were stated for this uh, architectural research that were higher level goals. Um, we want to be able to define the difference between core code, uh, things that are very critical for the user to complete a trip, um, and optional features that could be spared to turn off, be turned off if they were crashing the app, for example. Uh, with scale only expected to increase at the company, we wanted to set up a foundation that would continue to work for new developers to be added on without another rewrite. Uh, we wanted to create guidelines and rails for developers and designers to work on uh, so they could have fast, consistent, and reusable features across many apps. 
And you can't define success without properly measuring and you know, taking metrics. And it shouldn't be up to the individual teams to figure out what sort of app-wide metrics need to be looked at. And so our foundation should provide that and help assist with that as a first-class citizen. Uh, users rely on our application as a daily utility that's critical to their lives. A lot of people commute with the Uber app, uh, or they order meals through Uber Eats. Um, you know, this is, it's critical that this is operating for them. Um, and to move fast as a company, developers can't be afraid of breaking the app. So we needed to be able to de-risk experimentation, um, you know, allow this iteration without worrying about breaking it down. Lastly, our tools should empower and not inhibit a great app experience. It should be performant out of the box and handle things like degradation of low-end devices um, and all, all that sort of stuff that you would come to expect. So based on those architectural goals, uh, we investigated well-established architectures like MVC, MVVM, and Viper. And we found that each of those had flaws that made them not exactly suited for our needs. With MVC and MVVM, uh, you commonly have things like fat controllers that are introduced that become un unmaintainable, and that was similar to our old writer application where we started with one request class of 300 lines, and by the end of that project, it was many thousands and very unmaintainable, um, very fragile as well. And we liked a lot of things about Viper, including how explicit it is with the separation of concerns. Um, but using a pure imp implementation of Viper would have tied us to uh, create the app based on the view tree. And uh, we, in our mind, that's also leaking business logic through the presenter. And so based on those principles and the inspiration from Viper, uh, we created an open source to cross-platform architecture and framework around that called RIBS. It's implemented natively on Android and iOS, but the domain language is shared on both so that your engineers can talk and collaborate and have a similar language that they're talking with. Uh, a RIB unit is defined by a builder, which creates the other components of the RIB. An interactor to manage business logic uh, and a router to help with routing uh, between the ribs and navigation. Since we wanted the application to be tied to our, the, the application state tree to be tied to our business logic instead of the view tree, uh, the view and the presenter are also optional. And those do things like handle inflation, um, translating models and, and, anim and animations and all that sort of thing. Our writer application is then represented by, uh, by business logic in these state trees, uh, where each one of the nodes in this tree is a rib unit. And each one of these will only be instantiated, attached, and active when it's needed based on the flow that the user's in. So let's walk through what an active rib tree looks like when the user's requesting a ride. Initially, the only ribs that will be attached uh, will be related to the home screen. And as the user moves through the car request flow, confirming the ride, uh, the home ribs are detached and a confirmation rib is attached. And that's then followed by a refinement choice where the user can refine the location to be picked up. And finally, all pre-trip related ribs are detached and an on-trip branch is created and attached. Communication between the ribs was designed to justify or to satisfy the open-closed principle. For communication downwards, we rely heavily on our X streams. Uh, stream is placed on the DI graph, and then an emission is made that a, a child will subscribe to and consume. And for communication upwards, uh, the parent implements an interface that the child would define, and then the child would execute that interface. So with the backbone of our app defined, uh, I want to walk you through a lot of the tooling that we use to both support ribs as well as generally improve developer productivity at Uber, um, mostly that we've open sourced or that we contribute to. To assist developers with the ribs, um, we want to reduce boilerplate, because that's one of the major concerns that we've heard about using such a verbose architecture. And so we created an IntelliJ plugin that lives in the ribs uh, repo. And using this plugin, you can uh, bootstrap up a new unit of rib, which includes all of the components that I talked about, uh, as well as the dagger components that are used inside of the builders to simplify that. And now one of the most important pieces of functionality that was built into the new writer and driver app uh, is the ability to distinguish between core code and optional code, like I mentioned earlier. And that's backed by a plugin system. And so this plugin system uh, needs to enable these safe rails for developers to work on. And then, if needed, we can remotely turn off features from the back end. And so we recently open sourced a metadata generation tool called Crumb that can be the backbone of this type of functionality. 
Crumb enables you to generate metadata and downstream dependencies that act as providers of information that upstream parents can consume and act on uh, as an annotation processor. So we combine this with tools like Java Poet and Kotlin Poet so that we can generate code based on this metadata. So in this diagram taken from, our, uh, from the repo, you can see how a plugin system for collecting uh, dictionary translation implementations as plugins would look. Uh, we define these as libraries that could be managed across compilation boundaries through CodeGen and then collected in the parent. Now in Crumb's repo, you can see the full example of this, uh, this dictionary example, which is a, a pretty great starting place uh, for doing a, a plugin system of your own. Now, in our applications, however, we built a more complex version of this example, and it's backed by our A-B testing framework. Um, so this allows us to roll out a new feature behind a plugin, and in the event of a crash or an outage or a reduction in some metrics that we care about, we can disable that feature remotely. And so here's your typical plugin. Uh, it contains an identifier that can be referenced against a copy of enabled experiments, as well as the information to determine if this plugin is applicable for the specific dependency that we're asking about. And then we can provide a plugin point class, which is just a manager class that lists all the plugins that adhere to that specific interface of that common dependency. Finally, we're able to utilize that plugin point to request a specific plugin and act against its API. In this version, I've added a generic A-B testing framework as a parameter required to construct the plugin point. Um, this is kind of high level right now. Don't worry, I'll, I'll give a specific concrete example of this in a little bit with one of the other libraries. So I've walked you through a bit of the high level idea that the rib tree can attach and detach branches when needed. And of course, this implies that there are creation and destruction lifecycle events that are, being, that are happening within the rib tree. Um, I also mentioned that Ribs uses Rx a lot, and uh, many of you are probably guessing that there might be uh, memory issues or, or leak constraints that we might run into if cleanup isn't done properly. So to address automatic unsubscriptions for these Rx streams, we created a new library. Um, and this library is called Autodispose. So Autodispose provides a simple API for you to use in your Rx chain to manage automatic binding of Rx streams to a scope for disposal and automatic cancellation. The idea here is really simple. You construct your chain like any other. And then at the subscription, you just call uh, the static auto disposable method with one of three overloads for convenience. Uh, the first is the maybe concept. Uh, this is modeled after take until, which takes an observable that emits a signal uh, to signal that it's completed. Uh, the second is a lifecycle life scope provider, which is an interface that exposes lifecycle events that you care about to signal completion. So in the example of ribs, uh, one of our interactors would implement this interface. Uh, and then lastly is the scope provider, which is an abstraction that allows you to expose, control, and provide your own scopes for a little more uh, explicit control. Now these all return an auto-dispose converter object that implements all the Rx Java converter interfaces. Um, and that allows you to use it as with the as operator in RxJava. Also, auto-dispose exposes a lot more func optional functionality to make it really powerful, uh, including Kotlin extensions, uh, Rx lifecycle extensions, adapters to the Android architecture, uh, components, a plugin system modeled after RxJava's plugins, and an error-prone checker, and a lot more smaller things. Another area that can be really challenging in dealing with these dynamic app state trees is how do you reference a static snapshot of the tree? So a common area where we've seen this is, uh, is deep links. For example, you have a string that's serialized and it references a specific state of the app that needs to happen. So to address that, we designed and open sourced a framework that interrupts with ribs called workflows. Now workflows is a framework to describe reactive steps through the tree. The workflow framework is composed of three parts. Uh, the first is a step, which is a single action to be completed. The second is an actionable item. It's an interface representing uh, an, all the steps that a specific rib unit can accomplish. And the last is the workflow itself, which uh, describes the series of steps required to achieve its goal. Here's an example diagram of the workflow handling the single sign-in deep link uh, for our writer application. 
Uh, once the plugin point creates a specific workflow, which is a plugin, um, like I mentioned with Chrome, uh, the dependency that it received would be a, uh, a string that indicates a specific um, scheme and an action and set of query parameters, and it would decide that it's applicable for this specific uh, deep link and instantiate this plugin. Um, so once that's done, it's going to uh, describe this, this workflow will be created and it describes the steps that need to be completed. It'll use these steps uh, on each one of the actionable items on each one of the interactors as it navigates down through the rib tree. And with this, we're able to navigate down multiple ribs through the tree uh, to the single sign-on oriented uh, components. Now here's the code to handle the meat of that workflow. We have a series of steps that are defined that will walk from our root node, rib node, all the way down to our main interactor, um, at which point we have a utility method that allows us to attach any full screen rib. And we can attach explicitly the single sign-on rib, which we've instantiated in the plugin. For our, uh, example, in our root interactor, we define a step that waits until the user is signed in, and then it triggers the next step. Um, what this does is if the user was already signed in and they launched this deep link, it would immediately signal through a behavior subject, which is the signaler underneath, and it would continue into the next reactive step in the workflow. But if the user wasn't signed in, that part of the rib wasn't attached, it's going to wait here um, because workflows is backed by Rx until the user's completed the sign-in flow, and then it will continue the initial intention of the user clicking the deep link. So we've covered ribs and a variety of tools that help make them more usable. So let's move on to tools not directly related to ribs, but we still use to scale and enable uh, faster mobile development in Uber. So as Android apps grow, providing common features and consistency across UI elements can be really hard. Uh, we have a number of teams building UI functionality, and it's important to keep the app looking and feeling the same for users. Um, and so to keep consistency, uh, we collaborated with our designers to create a style guide that it exists in all of our apps in development um, and separately as an application that our designers and our program teams can consume to reference their specific needs when scoping out and building new features. But this introduces a couple problems. The first, in my mind, is that since Android hosts all the base views, um, it, it requires a lot of maintenance to keep all of the set of common views managed by potentially a platform team or a bunch of different teams that are contributing. Uh, where maybe you need to put a bug fix into a specific one and you're maybe duplicating that into the other features or trying to, to get that across. Um, we use that, we, we want things in all of our views like the Rx binding APIs, analytics, accessibility, among a host of other things. Uh, the second problem that um, is that as organizations grow, it's hard to communicate the way that things actually should be done, even providing great tooling. Um, how do you enforce that this is being adhered to, as opposed to creating a custom UI? And so to address the first point, we built and released a tool called Artist. Artist is a Kotlin-based code generating tool that allows you to generate a base set of views. So artist-generated views uh, are created using a stencil and trait system, where each view is declared with a single stencil, and it's comprised of a set of traits. And all of those come together to generate um, an easy to maintainable set of base views for your application. Now, a stencil describes the view that can be generated, and it has properties to configure, whereas the trait uh, defines a specific feature that you want to generate into that, into a one or more views. Here's a basic example of a trait. Here we want to create a convenience method for checking the different visibility states of a view. Uh, so we'll iterate through the visible states, and then we'll create convenience me methods, is invisible, is visible, and is gone. And then we'll write up our stencil, which will be, it'll specify that view information to be generated, as well as adding the traits that uh, we want, including in that view, so the one we just wrote up. Now we can see what a generated view would look like. For, uh, in this case, we have all the three methods that we, we just wrote up to generate. Uh, so for more information on what Artist is, as well as how to use it, as well as detailed instructions, um, check out the repo, which we have linked down here. So this, uh, this first way we address, this is, this is a way that we address 
the next problem, usage in the organization, uh, and many similar types of problems to it. We make extensive use of Lint rules. Um, this will give developers immediate feedback if they're doing something wrong. Now, we have a sample uh, a sample lint here that extends the resource XML detector. And this is taken from a much more complex view in the application, but I narrowed it down to the single example that we're using. Now, when this discovers usage of the standard switch compat, which we were just writing, uh, it will throw an error to the developer informing them to use the auto-generated foo switch instead. Secondly, we automatically add blocking reviewers to, uh, in our code review process, if certain behaviors uh, are used or adjusted by using Herald, which is part of the Fabricator code review tool suite. It's an open source code review tool originally built by Facebook. Uh, it's an, Herald is a powerful part of our tool chain. Uh, as any team grows, it, it's important to become uh, made aware when these sort of changes are happening by other people that you may not be aware of. In addition to the errors that I mentioned, there are a slew of others that will impact large software projects more and more. Uh, the larger the project grows, the more often you're going to run into these, um, especially easy to avoid common errors like the infamous null pointer exception. Now, one tool that we use uh, on our mobile projects is Errorprone. It's a fast compiler plugin built by Google that will fail at build time with common errors and an easy to write checker plugin system so that you can extend upon it. For example, in this piece of code here, uh, we're injecting our object graph after we've called the super on create. And that can become problematic with configuration changes and the Android system automatically reattaching fragments and you potentially not having your dagger graph in place yet. Uh, so error prone will halt the execution at build time, uh, not, not after through static analysis. And it'll let you know about the error and you can resolve it at that point. And error prone makes it easy to write new checkers for error types. Uh, when we looked at the benefits of Kotlin and Swift, of course, one obvious win was the way it handled nullability and how it throws that error in your face at compile time. Using error prone as the basis of, uh, of this checking framework that we wanted, we wrote and open sourced a tool called Nullaway. Uh, and it, it's specifically designed to help solve that billion dollar mistake and give you Kotlin's nullability in Java. And it's fast, and it can run on every build of your app with little overhead. Uh, with a quick example here, uh, we have a method that takes x and it prints it out. Now, in this case, we're sending null. Now, by default, null away assumes that all unannotated un methods are non-null by default. So build time, null away will halt and alert us to the issue. We have a null pointer exception. And we can fix that issue by adding the annotation and a null check to prevent a second null away exception from happening later on. Because if we had just taken null, then we'd get that exception on the x.toString. So at Uber, we combine error prone with another tool, validation tool that we wrote called RAVE. Uh, RAVE stands for Runtime Annotation Validation Engine. Uh, RAVE uses the annotations already present in your data models to generate validators that can be used at runtime to inform you if the models you may be receiving from your backend or uh, pulling off disk are the contract that you expect. So if we wanted to use RAVE, first we'd need to create a validator factory. Now, this is a sample factory generated validator, um, and you'd uh, put, create one of these per module. And then uh, you could annotate your model with the factory class. Uh, that's going to be generated automatically uh, once you've created that, that factory. Now, what's happening here is we have this model that we're hydrating from JSON, and we're mentioning that things are not null, and um, you know, potentially other constraints as well. Now, we know at compile time that that's true, but since we're pulling this from the network, we don't know at runtime if this constraint is actually being adhered to. But because we've annotated with this and we've generated the validator, we can then run this validator, um, and it's going to check against all of the constraints that we had written out to make sure that this actually adheres to the contract that we would expect. So a great place to put something like this would be potentially in your retrofit adapter so that you know when you got a thing back from your server if it's actually what you expected it to be or not. Now, while RAVE is a really powerful uh, tool, and we use it when we have dynamic data that we need to 
to utilize in the apps. I'd actually recommend a different approach for dealing with your data models and your API uh, whenever possible. Um, I'd recommend you use a tool like Protobuf or Thrift to have the same generated model that lives both on the client and on the server, and then you have a binary transfer across the network to ensure that those are identical. Now, these tools typically allow you to define a language agnostic uh, spec that then provides a compiler to generate out the Java files, the Swift files, the you know, back-end Ruby files, whatever, whatever you're interopping with. Now, uh, we use this for most of our main models and services now. Uh, we still don't have it entirely baked in, but it's, it's mostly there. Uh, this is also much more efficient across the wire, so if you're dealing with things like uh, network conditions, like slow networks in emerging markets, or other constraints, uh, this is gonna be a lot more beneficial to you. Now, we, we primarily use our model gen stack built on top of Thrifty. Thrifty is Microsoft's uh, Thrift compiler for mobile that's focused on Android. If you're familiar with Wire, Wire was built by Square, and it will generate uh, protobuf files from IDLs. And we, if you take those, uh, the Wire spec, or the Wire generated files versus the standard protobuf generated ones, the Wire ones, since they're focused on mobile, are gonna be a lot lighter. It's lacking a lot of the um, you know, different bloat that you might normally see in generated models. Thrifty is a very similar approach. Uh, but built on top of Thrift instead of on top of Protobuf. So lastly, as I said, this talk really isn't a deep dive into one of these specific tools over the other. It's more of a starting point for a lot of the stuff that we're working on and contributing to, and that I think could be very useful for a lot of folks in the community as they're starting to scale their teams out past uh, one to a handful of engineers to looking 10 plus with a number of modules. Um, should be really a starting point for you to think about opinionated scaling. Don't use everything that I'm, I've listed here. It's probably not for your application. We're at a different constraint than you are. But start to think about what opinionated scaling may look like without over-engineering. So many of my colleagues have done great deep dive talks into these different topics that I recommend. Um, I would ask that if you're interested in any of these that you watch some of these other talks that I've listed here, these d dive into things like the ribs architecture, the uh, monorepo tools that we're using, um, our plugin system, and a lot more. Um, when I publish this later, you can also get these links directly. Uh, also be on the lookout for more open source libraries. Um, we're just scaling up our initiatives there, so expect a lot more coming the rest of this year, and uh, even more next. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, I hope that some of these provides really good pointers for you to think about scaling your own app. Uh, if this sort of work interests you, uh, we're definitely hiring, uh, both in the States and in Europe. Um, I'll be around to take questions. Uh, you can ask maybe a couple here. Otherwise, um, it'd probably be a lot easier to have these conversations in the hallway. Uh, so come find me there. You mentioned that uh, you have model generations. We do. And uh, how does it work uh, on the persistent layer? There is a man sitting right in front of you that has written this entire stack. Um, <laughs> if you want a deep dive into that, I'd recommend talking to him. But at a high level, uh, we have um, IDLs that live on the server and client. And then we have a pipeline that will generate these models. Uh, for persisting them, we're using auto value. Um, the uh, adapter is being tied into retrofit for pulling those down. Um, we're then storing those as uh, flat files on disk. Um, and then I guess it generates yeah. migrations? Um, because the app is mostly uh, mirroring the state of the server, um, the type of local data that you would expect at any one point is never hugely concerning for, for manipulating that. We have migrated things in the past, but that's not much, as much of a concern for local storage as many different types of applications. Cool, thanks. Uh, hello? Um, hey. hey. 
Uh, I was wondering, uh, you're talking about monorepos, yes. and you also mm -hmm. obviously release a lot of uh, libraries as, uh, on GitHub. Yes. And how do you reconcile uh, having those uh, open source components uh, in separate repos and yep. your monorepos? Um, we've experimented with a couple different approaches, including syncing out modules to an external repo. Um, I find that very problematic. Uh, I recommend instead uh, the approach that we've taken uh, a lot more recently, which is the, the modern repo is entirely for business logic and internal tooling, and once we do move to uh, an open source tool, that open source tool is developed in the public by default. So then that is a dependency that's consumed in a Gradle dependency, which then OKBuck okay, generates um, you know, the buck configs that have pulled that down as a cache and use that. Um, so that dependency, man that still introduces some of those problems of the API version bumps that we talked about. However, usually that's a single point externally that we're referencing, as opposed to um, referencing something externally that then has a series of transitive dependencies that we need to update on as well. So it still mitigates the pain. Hello, thanks for this. Uh Awesome presentation. You're welcome. I'm here. Where are you? Here. Ah, so there. OK. <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, uh, the continuous integration. How are you handling this uh, at a Uber scale? Uh, so we have a large set of Dockerized Jenkins instances that are running um, that we have verification jobs on the uh, code review being sent up through Fabricator. Um, that validates a number of different things, including running the unit tests and the UI tests. Um, once that has been verified through uh, the Jenkins jobs that are running, then we, um, when the developer decides to land that into master, we then run it through the SubmitQL tool that I talked about, and that happens automatically, where that uh, checks for um, Git conflicts, and it runs a series of, of more uh, extraneous tests before it lands that into master. Okay, uh, I think we're out of time. If you want to talk to me anymore, come find me after. And just what, one word, uh, please, Guy, pack up on the center. Uh, sorry for the class. <laughs> pack up on the center because there is a lot of people coming in, so to be quick, uh, just uh, a garbage collector yourself.